hey, Token Matrix family. Welcome to 100X Show. Yes, 100X Show is back. I'm your host, Ian Bellina, founder and CEO of Token Metrics and also a general partner at Token Metrics Ventures. And today we have a very, very special project, actually a product that was one of our first investments over at Token Metrics Ventures that is trying to innovate DeFi. It's called Notice Protocol. And we have the pleasure of being joined by the founder. Hey, Kamen, welcome to, uh, on the show. How are you? Nice to be here. Thank you for the invite. I'm very well. How are you there? Doing great, doing great. So you have a very innovative and unique project that I'm very, very excited to have here on the show. So before we actually kind of dive into the project, give us a background on yourself. What's your founder history? Sure. Well, I've started actually my career like almost 15 years ago. I have been doing finance for my entire life. I have spent more than approximately eight or 10 years in big four companies doing coding, doing consultancy, doing advisory work. Uh, I have been involved with lending a lot uh, on the Web2. I actually started doing uh, as a finance director of a crypto lender company that's entirely online for the past five or six years. And this is how I actually got into lending and different lending solutions. And what we're trying to do with Novos is actually export that lending solutions into the Web3 rather than the Web2. Okay, very interesting. So kind of... Talk to us about the team and their experience. We actually, when we started the idea, we were a couple of uh, people that were working with this Web2 lender. So me as a co-founder and the other co-founder, Ivan, who we have been working together for the past six years and a half, something like that. He's a product lead in the company uh, that's doing Web2 Lending and Finance Director. So we have been doing and developing a lot of products together. And we actually, we have been, we have been doing personal investments in crypto. We are very keen into that. We have been since probably 2017. But once we saw an, an inefficiency that we want to solve on how lending is done, this is where it all started. So we started, the two of us as an idea, we started like 20 months ago. We then turned out to be really passionate about what we could build. So we started bringing people in. We are currently more than 23 people fully employed for the Nose Protocol. Most of them, of course, developers. We've hired our CTO who has been doing blockchain for the past seven, eight years with VMware. And this is how we started building the team. And we actually started building the product itself. We have been building the product for the past probably six, four, for 15, 16 months already. And we actually launched just last week on the 23rd, we launched the product with the full functionalities. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely, definitely quite the accomplishment to take an idea and turn that into something and launch it to the whole world, especially in crypto and especially during a bear market. Now, kind of speak to the, my understanding is you guys are very, you guys were incubated by Nexo. So kind of speak to the ties between Nexo and No. We're actually incubated by this Web2 lender, who is, which is called... So basically, this lending company also gave birth in 2070 to the crypto lender. Uh, we were part of that team. We were part of the efforts, which actually... So basically, the company Credissimo bootstrapped Nexo as, uh, as a company. Then it got entirely different roadmap. So it started its own path. We continued working for with the passion of having this crypto experience with us. Well, Nexus started its own path with its own people, which actually developed into quite a large company and quite a large endeavor. Fascinating. So let's now maybe begin at the beginning again. So imagine somebody's buying in crypto or maybe brand new in DeFi. What exactly is the problem you're solving? Well, yeah, we actually, well, imagine it's 2070, 2018, everything and everybody was passionate about doing crypto lending. Uh, first, it started with Cephi, then it started with DeFi, all other compound products. They actually provide you financing up to, let's say, 50 60%, and you need to have a purchase deposited collateral beforehand. So basically, even with futures and perpetual contracts on centralized exchanges, you can get more than that 50%. But you don't receive ownership of the asset and you are actually exposed to quite high risk of liquidations. So these are the problems that we are trying to solve. We are actually trying to solve the problem of over collateralized lending, 
high risk of liquidation, asset ownership or lack of asset ownership, high costs, high transactions, slow transactions, all of those with one solution. Okay, interesting. Now, given the time we're in in crypto post FTX, Celsius, Voyager, and all these other centralized entities that have basically gone belly under, what exactly is unique about this and how is this di different? Okay, so starting from the from what we've seen in the past year. So Novos Protocol is actually a layer one, app-specific chain. It is built with Cosmos SDK or the technology beneath actually allows it to be much more flexible. But what it also allows is to be fully non-custodial, non meaning that a financial suit that actually allows you as a user to manage all of your digital assets in a non-custodial way. So you can actually come to the Novos Protocol and purchase, sell, swap, stake your crypto. You can also create, a, be a staker, be a lender to the protocol. But most importantly, you can take the lending solution, the DeFi list, the world's first DeFi list. This is why we called it a DeFi list. Why we called it a DeFi list is because we took a Web2 product, a lease, let's say purchasing a lease of a car, purchasing a mortgage, on a lease, you actually provide a down payment and you get larger exposure and the full coverage of that collateral. So transferred to the world of DeFi, you actually have borrowers that walk up a down payment, which could be in any currency. So fiat, stable, digital asset. They get up to 150% above that down payment. And the beauty of it is that you actually have the loan in stables and uh, the down payment acting. This gives you much more flexibility and much lower margin goals. So we're basically trying to, we're turning the model around in order for the borrowers to have more exposure, three times more exposure at lower liquidation risk, lower cost, and actually own the asset through the, through the contract. So basically they can yield optimize, have yield strategies during the amplified position of the DeFi lease and earn the reward. And in that way, basically creating self-repaying loans. Let's maybe kind of go through what you just mentioned again with this diagram. So imagine somebody is maybe not technical and maybe not that familiar with I work When they hear you can have one and a half to what, three, three times your collateral, it sounds too good to be true. Right? It sounds like a, like a Ponzi, right? How, how exactly, through the technical math, explain how this is happening using this diagram. Okay, so... On the top right, we have lenders. They provide stable coins into the pool of nodes. So everything within the protocol would be working in stable coins. Now, if the borrower comes and he wants to take some uh, stables out of this pool, you can. they can actually provide a down payment. This down payment could be in any currency. Let's say that they have 100 stable coins and they want to provide it as down payment. They can take 150 out of this centralized liquidity that has been provided by lenders. So they now have 250 in stables and they want to purchase some kind of an asset, Ethereum, BTC, Atom, whatever that is. They can purchase that asset immediately with 250 in stables for and actually walk the full amount of purchased tokens. So let's say that you want to purchase Atom at 10. So you're basically purchasing 25 Atoms for 250 of exposure, those atoms are actually walked into the smart contract and they now act as your collateral, meaning that you have much more collateral compared to the crypto lenders where you provide only the down payment. And it, by acting as collateral, it actually gives you 40% lower liquidation rates. And it would be only partial liquidation. It wouldn't be full liquidation once the liquidation trigger is met. It would be only a partial one meaning that it gives you more time to be into the position. Okay. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it sounds very, it's very, very interesting and fascinating. And to me, uh, and our team was very innovative. Let me just kind of try to maybe rephrase it um, to make sure we, we have this right. Because I think, because even with us, it took us a while to really understand uh, how innovative this is. So essentially, you're letting people borrow and giving them collateral. I mean, so they, they can put the collateral for the deposit. They can borrow funds. But these funds stay within the NOAA's ecosystem, which is an app chain in the Cosmos ecosystem. And you guys basically reduce the threshold for default right? because the funds are being locked in a smart contract in the ecosystem and are, and are still tradable 
on a DEX inside the ecosystem. Does that sound right? Or maybe this is entirely no, no, that's that's entirely correct. And this is this is how everything staying on the protocol actually allows the protocol to give more to customers in terms of exposure, in terms of better terms as collateral, and in terms of lower margin quotas. Okay. Now, how does this compare to other competitors in the space? Well, first of all, first competitors are Aave compounds or centralized lenders. They give up to 50% of their deposited collateral. And if the price starts dropping after approximately 35% drop of the price, you get fully liquidated. This is one of the solutions. The other is futures and perpetual contracts on centralized exchanges, where, for example, you can take more than the 50%, but you receive no ownership. You are basically, basically acting as either winning or losing on an asset position without owning the actual asset. Now, nodes on the other side, you have the ownership of the asset. You purchase the asset at the very beginning of the provisioning of down payment. So you provide a down payment, you actually purchase the asset. Once you purchase the asset, it allows you to, for example, do liquid staking or do uh, some yield optimization strategies in order to earn rewards during your amplified position. This allows you to create something like a stealth repaying loan because the interest that you'll be receiving is actually higher than the interest that you'll be paying. This allows you to have no cost virtually for your amplified position. And the beauty of it is that you actually don't put the borrower at a higher risk. You put them at lower risk because you provide more collateral for their whole exposure. Now, given Black Swan events, like what happened with UST and Terra Luna, how do you, how, how would a protocol like this react in a volatile time, like in a crypto Black Swan event, right? Where you have, with, for example, the market dropping 30, 40% in, in 12 hours, right? Would there be a, a flight to liquidity? If so, how would this protocol react to that? There are two very important things here. First of all, Everything within the protocol works in stables and our NOS token does not have anything to do with any of the operations. Meaning the NOS token is essential because it gives utility to people, it gives them lower or higher interest, it gives them the availability to stake, to use the protocol, to use it as gas. But the, the price of the NOS, because you mentioned the Terra collapse, the price of the NOS actually doesn't get involved into the protocol solvency and liquidity. So if the price drops of the NOS, it doesn't matter to the protocol. Now, this is step one. Step two is that actually everything works within stables. So the stables actually get swapped on a on DEX once it needs to be liquidated. For example, if the price starts dropping, because our network would be, our smart contracts would be connected to the DEX itself and funds would be staying on the DEX, it actually takes less than three to four seconds in order to liquidate an asset if that needs to happen. So it would get a liquidation much faster compared to a regular user trying to do a liquidation on a DEX. This allows us to never miss a liquidation or to be in a very rare situation. And if that happens, there is always a buffer, a small buffer of a couple of percentages that would allow that the total value that has been collected for the lenders is sufficient to cover the full deposit plus the interest that they have provided. Okay. Now, why did your team choose uh, Cosmo ecosystem as opposed to Ethereum for DeFi and lending and borrowing? Basically, in order, one, one sentence answer is to really provide different perks to different stakeholders. Because if you put a smart contract on Ethereum, you can do the DeFi easy. Now, what you cannot do is actually provide utility to the NOS token to the degree that we have provided. Because the NOS token, first of all, acts as gas because it's a app chain. Second of all, it allows different users to do different things on the protocol. So basically, lenders would be receiving higher interest, borrowers would be receiving lower interest, then if you stake sufficient amounts of funds, you would be actually unlocking different products. Instead of 150%, you can unlock 300% or 500% of 
or basically create a sell position rather than buy position. And all of that is allowed and could be done through the Cosmos ecosystem. And keep in mind that we would be IBC and interchain accounts from day one. Now, this is essential because this allows us to be cross-chain almost immediate. So the end goal of Nolos is actually to become something like, imagine it like, uh, maybe I could say it like a margin trading protocol, but one-stop shop for your crypto, meaning that this margin trading protocol would allow you to own the asset on different chains and do cross-chain leverage margin trading with lower risk and actual ownership of the asset. So once we actually connect towards different ecosystems, it at the end, a user taking a solution from an Ethereum network, he would be taking the DeFi lease without him understanding that he's switching blockchains. Everything would be done with two clicks, very simple UI, very simple solution, and doing cross-chain transactions with IBC and Interchain account. That's why we chose Cosmos. Okay, uh, that's, that's, that's uh, great to hear. Now, how big do you think DeFi on Cosmos can become? And do you believe DeFi on Cosmos can become bigger than DeFi on Ethereum and on other blockchains? To be honest, whether it could become higher than Ethereum, Ethereum is pretty big in terms of DeFi. So it has a long road to go in order to do that. But here, Noah's protocol doesn't, we are not aiming at being a Cosmos DeFi. We are aiming to be as a Cosmos DeFi as starters, but actually be a DeFi on any network. That's why I was stressing so much on the cross-chain activities, because it actually doesn't really make sense to be on Cosmos only. It makes sense to be everywhere at the same time. And this is what we are aiming for. So yes, I think that the Cosmos ecosystem is growing. It would be growing a lot. DeFi would be growing a lot on the Cosmos ecosystem because there is no large lending solution so far that would allow and accommodate customers on the Cosmos. But also going outside of the Cosmos ecosystem, there is a lot of opportunities for nodes to grow. Now, so does that mean you guys could potentially um, go on to other platforms, for example, Canto, which is an Ethereum EVM in the Cosmos ecosystem? Would that be possible or is that purely something uh, down the road? No, it's it's down the road, but it's in the short term. So what we are planning to have is actually tap the liquidity of EVM chains in 2023. So uh, with the only thing that actually is stopping us to do that is that we needed to launch and have some traction first and then use bridge solutions, for example, Axel or uh, general message balancing in order to move those tokens from EVM chains towards Cosmos. And that's it. Otherwise, the IBC connectivity allows us to do transaction cross-chain without any any further technology need. That's great. Okay, so now in terms of you guys being a new project, how do you, how do you plan to have a moat and defend yourselves from other protocols that maybe have a lot more funding? For example, you mentioned Aave. How do you... Can they not just add this feature so what's the exact mode how do you how do you defend yourselves as a project i love that question actually uh well ave compound those are great products they are they have their usage they have been very popular since in the past couple of years but they have fragmented liquidity meaning that for example they are built on one platform if they want to move to another platform they need to rebuild their smart contracts put it on that another platform, another blockchain, then build liquidity from ground up. This is one. The second problem is that they have segregated liquidity in terms of pools. So a BTC pool, Ethereum pool, whatever asset, it is on a separate pool. So a borrower lender participates in a transaction for a particular pool, BTC pool. Now, Novus actually solves both of that because as I mentioned previously, the stable coins pools are actually essential because we have one liquidity, stable coin liquidity, and lenders provide stable coins into the pools. Those stable coins are switched for every borrower separately on a different smart contract on a DEX without us having a DEX or having the liquidity of a DEX. And we are able to switch that stable coins into, for example, UAS 
purchase BTC, but I want to purchase Ethereum. We can do it from that stablecoin pool immediately, have those assets locked into the smart contract, own the asset, and we can go cross-chain without fragmenting that liquidity. That sounds great. That's incredible. Okay. Now, with all this being said, have you had any customer interviews or potential users or testnet? Uh, if so, how's that gone? How have you been able to validate this is something people actually want to use in crypto and DeFi? Yeah, we actually started our testnet in December uh, 2022. So almost five months ago, we put a beta of the product live approximately a month and a so, two months ago. Since then, we have more than 5,000 users that actually try the protocol. They provided a lot of, uh, let's say, features and a lot of improvements and feedback towards the final product, towards the UI, how it looks, how it feels. So we've implemented those uh, recommendations into the final version that would be going to live this week, at the end of this week. So we put the main net on the 23rd uh, live, the blockchain. Now we're up and running for the web app to go live this week. Uh, so we have more than 5,000 people. They have actually done a lot of transactions. They have done a lot of recommendations. We've learned a lot during those two months of beta testing because they, first of all, showed us where our, let's say, UI inefficiencies were and we solved them. We also did try the network and the blockchain of how it behaves and how good it performs in different stressful situations which was a great test. And now we are ready to really go to the live product and, and try it out to different and more people. So how can people become involved in Nellis and actually use it? What's the way to, to partake in it? Well, if you want to use the, uh, if you want to read a little bit of materials, we have great uh, level of materials in Medium, in our Twitter, in our Twitter at Nellis Protocol, at our uh, website, Nellis.io, also as well, uh, we also do have, uh, once you go to Nose.io, you can see the beta version of the demo app. So you can actually go connect to the app, uh, try it out if you want to. You'll be able to do that on live and in a couple of days. Now, what are the main metrics you plan to track uh, for your app chain once you go live? And these are typical metrics you would see on DeFi Llama and other data providers, or are you tracking other metrics and other economics? Yeah, the most essential would be total value locked, of course, in especially of lenders and stable coins. Uh, it would be the number of users, their usage, meaning their average loans, their average usage, because uh, as I mentioned, we want to be like a one-stop shop for your crypto. You don't have to take the lending solution in order to be on notes. You can just swap, you can just take, you can just earn, you can be a lender. You can deposit some NOS, you can earn from the inflation. All of those are available without you becoming and taking the DeFi lease. But the DeFi lease is the core product. So everything KPIs would also very much depend on how the DeFi lease performs, how many users we have for the DeFi lease. What assets do they take? We're probably starting with approximately 10 to 12 assets that are available on the decks of choice, which would be us. But then the whole idea is to move from osmosis decks as one dex to multiple and actually use multiple assets for the DeFi lease and allow different assets with more liquidity to be there. In order to have more liquidity, we need to be connected to more dexes. Once we are connected to more dexes, then we actually can provide more assets and be certain that liqu liquidations, if they need to happen, would happen on time. Okay. Now, what are the tokenomics uh, or unit economics for the protocol? And how is the token being used? Uh, what's the, the main incentive for people to have the token? Well, the NOS actually is absolutely vital to the ecosystem. First of all, it's, it's a layer one. So NOS is used for gas. You cannot transact without having NOS. But also the NOS incentivizes stakeholders on the protocol. First of all, borrowers get lower interest if they have stake sufficient NOS. Lenders have higher interest. But also, if you stake a certain amount of NOS as a borrower, you would be, I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, you will be able or allowed to take more exposure, take a short position rather than a long position. So in a way, in a way, 
the nodes actually in the NOS token becomes vital for you to do different transactions depending on what you want to do on the protocol. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is also one very essential thing here that, uh, for example, there, is, there are three revenue streams to the protocol. These revenue streams, they are swap fee, transaction fee, transaction cost, swap uh, margin cost. All of those revenues, they have one simple purpose. And this simple purpose is to buy back our native token on the open market and refill an incentive pool. This incentive pool provides additional rewards to lenders so that they get incentivized to continue being there on the protocol. So initially, this incentive pool would contain 12% of the total token supply. It would distribute up to 15% APY to lenders. But with the three revenue streams buying back our native token, and when volume, especially when volume increases, it would be becoming, or the protocol would be purchasing more of our NOS token and would make it a little bit of deflationary, refilling this incentive pool and providing it to lenders in the long term. So this creates a, a model where lenders stay on the protocol for a longer term rather than only at the beginning when yields are higher. Good to know. Okay, uh, moving on. Now, what's the, the, business, the business model of the actual development company? I mean, because there's also obviously the, the token, um, but kind of walk, walk us through how uh, the, the company or entity developing this project, how it's tied to the project, how they plan to, to be long-term um, advocates of this protocol. Yeah, so it's fully decentralized. So there is no company, there is no entity, there is no revenue, there is no net income for the company. So what we have instead is our incentive being there is that we own part of the tokens, and this is the team and contributors token. They are a total of 19% of the total token supply, and they are incentivized to stay walk on the protocol because they have 15 months walk and 36 months linear vest. So basically we have like two times more compared to the first seed round investors in terms of walks and vestings, and our end goal is to incentivize and have usage on the protocol. Because the more usage we have, the more users we have, the more total value we have, the larger the amount of uh, price for the NOS token, which is the only way that the team would be able to monetize that investment that we have done so far. That's good. All right. Um, now tell us about the future roadmap. What do we have in store for a knowledge protocol? Well, part of the things is to really, after launch, what we want to do first as a very short-term goal, we are having a stream swap, meaning a community-driven uh, pool that would be launching on stream swap on the 13th of June. This would be our first pool. Once we do that, or our first, let's say, uh, price discovery, once we do that, we would be launching a pool on Osmosis with the NOS token. And... On the longer term, what we want to add is different features. For example, uh, moving towards EVM chains, this is essential. Having a ramp, ramp on and ramp off solution in, in the next three or four or five months, it's also essential. We want to really integrate and partner strategically with different uh, protocols. Now, for example, we want to build liquidity on different DEXs. DEXs are essential because we need to integrate it with, with as many DEXs as possible. For example, we have already discussed with Crescent and Astroport. Those would be the two second and third DEX after Osmosis that we would be um, we would be integrating with, but also moving outside of the Cosmos ecosystem, really integrating with as much as DEXs. Even on the AVM chains, this is essential because it gives more assets to the people, more availability and higher liquidity for our uh, for our swaps and for our liquidations if those needs to happen. So these are the long-term goals, really building liquidity as well in terms of uh, our NOS token, having liquidity on different DEXs and sexes. And finally, uh, bringing those utility features to the NOS that are essential to the people. 
Okay, now, how do you plan to go to market? Because obviously, uh, the market is very crowded, and it's always tough for new products to stand out or get attention in a crowded market. So how do you plan to go to market? And do you have any other partnerships or anything like that in, in store? Okay, so uh, we have been doing a lot of go-to-market in the past two or three months by, first of all, our advisory body, which includes uh, uh, people like very prominent people within the Cosmos ecosystem, like Zeki Mania, Strange Lab Ventures, people that are very, people in the Cosmos are very familiar familiar with those uh, with those people. So what we try to do is really push those and push the Gnos community, uh, the uh, Cosmos community to understand what Gnos is, how it does. But this is starting from the Gnos. I think, I think we have the community on the Cosmos already knowing about what we're building. We have been partnering with a lot of people and projects within the Cosmos ecosystem, including Stride Persistence, Astroport, Fresh Chant, I've mentioned in terms of DEXs. Uh, we also do have strategic partners that are quite, quite, quite essential because they are very, let's say, indeed strategic. Because as you guys, together with Dorafax, Cog Cognitant Ventures, a lot of the validators are actually part of our seed round. We actually completed approximately a month and a half ago, a 1.5 million seed round raising for the technological development in the next 18 months to happen. So this was the only race we've done so far. It has been, and it's deemed by me as a huge success because it has come in one of the toughest, barest markets that we have seen in the past couple of years. So we are very happy that we managed to get people really liking what we are building. Now, moving forward, really pushing on the Cosmos ecosystem and the Cosmos narrative, and then moving towards EVM chains or even Avalanche, different users from all over once we are able to do cross chains. That's good. Yeah, I mean, uh, so our firm, Token Matrix Ventures, is also very excited to be an investor and be part of that round. Uh, and we're actually in the process of looking into running our own notes for NOAS. So very, very um, proud, of, proud for that. Okay, so um, now with post-FTX, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. Post-FTX, what are the regulation risks around DeFi, borrowing and lending, and well, how do you think the crypto community is going to view all these new innovations post FTX and Celsius and Voyager and all these other entities that have had issues and challenges? Well, I think that you mentioned sufficient information to understand the whole problem was in centralized ent entities rather than decentralized. Because all the companies you've mentioned are actually run by people. And once those uh, companies are run by people usually there is an availability for people to mislead the customer funds for example this was the case that in the companies that you've mentioned so to me the the product and how the market developed and in terms of regulatory risk everything could turn into defi so a decentralized non custodial solutions without actual organizations that are taking care of lenders funds and depositors funds and then distributing towards borrowers some kind of an interest that's up to them to decide uh, solutions that are entirely done by code. They feel like knows, for example, is done entirely by code. The code decides what to do based on the parameters that we have discussed so far during this one hour. And that's it. There is no human involvement. There is no availability for a person to misuse funds. And I think this is the future. In, in terms of regulatory risk, I think it's much less regulated risk compared to the centralized the, uh, centralized entities that we have seen in the past year and a half. Okay, um, very well said. Now, last point. So with putting that aside, when it comes to entities or projects that are fully decentralized, the other concern is typically around smart contract tax. So I understand you have two audits. So could you uh, speak to the audits you've, you've had? Yes, of course. So we've actually accomplished two audits by Oak Security. One was entirely focused on the blockchain and how it's structured so that uh, so the blockchain one and then the smart contracts is the second. 
both of those were actually pretty deep in terms of uh, in terms of audit, and they have proven that what we have built is pretty stable because we don't have any significant issues, no critical issues, no major issues. We actually do have a couple of minor issues that we have already solved, and it's it's present in our reports that we have already solved. Now, we are all currently and already started doing another audit with Halborn, which would give us an additional assurance that everything that we've built and have been building is stable enough from a second opinion. This is essential to us. Security, I think in DeFi, generally, security is the only thing that is the most essential because once, from going from the previous sentence, you have only decentralized participants that are smart contracts. As long as your smart contracts are performing well without the availability to be breached, everything should be fine. All right. Um, so any last words you want to share with the audience regarding Noah's protocol? Uh, my last words would be that I really wanted to thank you guys because you have been a very, let's say, good friend in terms of First of all, being there in a very early stage. And second of all, helping us with different strategic partnership, which is essential for any project nowadays. Ever, but nowadays essentially. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I mean, I'm definitely excited. A very, very exciting project. Um, we always like to find new, new projects that are trying to, to disrupt crypto and open finance in Web3. That being said, thank you for coming on the show. Common, it's a pleasure. And that, that being said, Talk to you next time. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for watching The 100X Show. Bye. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we have even more content for you at Tokyo Metrics. Get there using the link down below.